Welcome everybody. Thanks for coming along on a cold Armadale winter night. Um, I'm Kirsty Abbott. Um, I've seen most of you before and um, James O'Hanlon and I are kind of chopping and changing to host Science in the Club but I'm pleased to be back after not um, hosting this year. It was nice to be in the audience. Um, so um, before I start, Science in the Club uh, is run by New, uh, the New England Northwest Regional Science Hub which is a conglomerate of number of organisations uh, with people within them are passionate about um, getting science out of the labs um, and communicating complex ideas to you know number of audiences across a number of really cool disciplines, many of which we have um, researchers and academics and scientists in Armadale uh, researching. So you know, and if anyone is interested in joining the Regional Science Hub, you are more than welcome. Um, there's, we're always interested in having new members, particularly um, you know if you're into running public events and things like that. We've had, we've been going for about five years now, I think, um, and doing all sorts of projects, so it's really nice. This is our third year for Science in the Club, though, so if this is your first, anyone here first time Science in the Club? A number of people, awesome, awesome, welcome, welcome. Even the speakers, great. <laughs> So Science in the Club um, is brought to you by the Regional Science Hub. We're sponsored by Inspiring Australia, which is the, the government um, body that um, supports science communication and public science. Um, but also the Wicklow's been hosting us for two years now. Um, and UNE has been a big backer as well. And I want to say thank you before we start. Ian Mackay and Michael Partridge, thank you. you got, those guys have been doing AV for three years too. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But without further ado, our, um, our topic for tonight is parasites, the wildlife of your bodies, of other animals' bodies, the wildlife of biology, the kooky stuff that goes on and is totally normal in, you know, in evolutionary biology and in nature every day, right from tiny microscopic scale to macro scale, um, but that we very rarely take notice of. Um, we're lucky to have two speakers with us tonight who love parasites. <laughs> uh, Dr. Peter Hunt from CSIRO and Dr. Tommy Leung from UNE. And um, I'm not really going to go rave on about parasites because I'm going to let them take over. So Peter Hunt, um, please come forward. Please join me in welcoming Peter to tell us about worms. Welcome, Peter. Okay, too loud, too soft, fine. Okay, parasites, worms. So I'm going to talk about the wormy sort of parasites and I'm also going to talk about the parasites that are a bit closer to home. If you want to get out there, Tommy's talk's next, don't miss it. So, spoken by Peter Hunt for Urella. Okay, <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> right, what's a worm? All sorts of parasites exist but they're not all worms. So the flea is an insect, not a worm, and the louse is an insect, not a worm, and malaria is a protozoa, it's not a worm. The rest of them are worms, and I divide them into these three groups. Tommy has a far more sophisticated way of classifying them, I'm sure. But there's cestodes, which are the segmented worms, round worms, which um, are not segmented, and flat worms, which are flat. So they're the ones we're going to talk about today. I'm going to take you to a spot. This is actually near Narrabri where this grave is. Um, it stands in the middle of a paddock. Uh, it's not quite as in a good a condition as, as this picture might lead you to believe. But anyway, it's still there. It's the, very, it's the um, grave of Samuel Goldman. In the paper when he died back in the 1800s, it said that he was buried under a tree where he often sat with his favourite dog. Don't forget that. That comes back, the dog bit. Okay, here's his death certificate. A bit morbid, isn't it? Here's his cause of death. Now, for those of you who struggle with old-fashioned writing, like I do, it's hydatid's disease of the liver, okay? So that's what killed this guy. What is hydatid's disease? Hydatid's disease is a parasite. And it's a parasite that lives as an adult, as a segmented worm like these guys. Can I do pointing? I can do pointing. Look, like that. Inside that, that's what we're looking at. These guys lay eggs. Oh no, it stopped working yet. Those guys lay eggs <laughs> that go out into the poo of the dog. Some, some versions of 
hi dad is living foxes but they're mostly overseas ones but i like the picture so it's in there <laughs> just about everything that's a vertebrate and a mammal can get high dads in the second part of the life cycle. So that's where you have these cysty things in your internal organs and they can grow really huge and they can kill you like they killed Samuel Goldman. Okay, so they're pretty nasty. So the, the life cycle is then the dog will eat you or the sheep or whatever it is that has these things and then the, these guys will grow inside the dog's tummy and off it goes. So that's the life cycle of a high dadded tapeworm. So let's go back to Samuel and think about how we can control tapeworms. Why is it that we don't all have high dadids? Most of us have dogs. Most of us don't have high dadids. It's because we wash our hands after we look after the dog, don't we? Everybody does that. <laughs> all right. We treat our dogs with drugs to get rid of the tapeworms. That's a pretty important one. This is praziquantel. We're going to talk a little bit about praziquantel in a minute. If we're living on a farm and we've got animals, we don't leave offal and dead animals lying around for foxes and wild dogs to find, do we? Or our pet dogs, we bury it. And we control those wild dogs and things too. The other thing you can do if you're on a farm and you sell livestock is you can look at the abattoir feedback form, which some people get, and that'll tell you whether or not any of your animals had high dadids. And not only that, they also not pay you as much for those animals. <laughs> so it's pretty important to farmers to understand this stuff. And most of them do. Pretty good. So how, many, how often are you likely to die of high dadids or even be infected by high dadids? So some people in our parasitology society that Tommy and I belong to have studied this in the literature. 321 cases between 1987 and 1992. So that's... That's not a huge number of people, but the incidence there is about a quarter of that of motor neuron disease. So, you know, if you've ever known someone with that, about a quarter of as many people get this. The interesting thing is the hotspot for high data disease in Australia is New England. <laughs> okay. Joyous thing. So it's worth, it's worth telling you all about this stuff. So it's a serious but still rare disease, luckily because of all the things we do to control it. About drugs. So these aren't the type that make you hallucinate. These are the type that get rid of worms. Okay, so there's a lot of different drugs on the market that do different things. Um, and it's important to know which ones you're using. So, a little bit of more public education about things. So this is the label of Drontal Allwormer, one of the um, dog wormers you can buy. Important bits, there's what's in it and what it controls. There's how to use it properly. And a little warning, if you don't use it properly, it actually may be illegal. So, good idea to use it properly. Um, sheep, we use these things in sheep too. Here's another example. This is what it kills. This is how to uh, use it properly. Uh, Praziquantel, I mentioned, that's in this one. Uh, it was in the previous one too. Um, withholding periods, so this is a new thing. So when we're talking about dogs, we don't care, but when we're talking about sheep and cows, how long before we can eat the meat or drink the milk or whatever? That's important too. And this is the list of parasites this particular drug controls, supposedly. Right. It controls a different tapeworm in the sheep because sheep don't have the adult tapeworm inside them, but they do for this other species. Right. Now, the interesting thing for me about Praziquantel is it was first sold in the 1970s, but there's no resistance. There's, this drug works perfectly well today as it did in 1970-whatever when it came out. But I will tell you the drug resistance is inevitable for all effective drugs, the thing is, we just don't know when it's going to start. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about drench resistance on farms. So this is just a single table showing some results. So this is a proportion of farms that had resistance to a bunch of different chemicals, which I'm not going to explain. But you can see there some farms, 74% resistant to ivermectin, for example. 
So that's one, one of, at least one of the parasites on the property resistant to that drug. So resistance is a really big deal for agriculture, for livestock agriculture. Okay, now I'm going to take a little sideways step now. When worms go good, so are worms always bad? No, correct. <laughs> Here's some worms that aren't good or bad. So uh, there's a rat tapeworm there and this worm of chickens called Ascaridia goli, which we've done some work on at UNE with our colleagues there in the animal science. Both of them, you can infect the host with quite a lot of these things and there's really little effect that you can measure. So there you go, who would have thought? Some of our medical colleagues are pushing that further. They wonder whether worms might be beneficial. And most of the papers about these things are about these autoimmune diseases and whether or not having a worm inside you or a parasite inside you can alter your immune system and help you with these sorts of diseases. Now, I'm not going to say this works because it's still unresolved in the literature, right? But it's pretty cool stuff. It's an idea. So in Queensland, some guys uh, from James Cook University have infected patients with Crohn's disease with worms and they've used an endoscope to make sure those worms are there. And I thought, you might want to see that. Can you, <laughs> can you double tap for me, please? Thank you. <laughs> there, here's the worms inside this person, deep inside this person. <laughs> and there he is, wriggling around. I think that's just about the end of the... That worm is Nicator americana, which is a hookworm. Hookworm, yeah. Is that the one Thank you. If, if you take Combantrin, that kill that? Combantrin may kill it if, if they're not resistant. Yes. Now, I like to do a quiz of my own, <laughs> but it's a pretty easy one. Righto. After handling animals to prevent infectious diseases, we should A, send a selfie via Instagram. B, go immediately to accident and emergency. C, wash our hands, or D, wash the car. Wash your hands. Who's, who's with A? Who votes A? Who votes B? <laughs> Who votes C? I would have hoped a few more than that. Who votes D? Oh, true, yeah, it's dual purpose. Right, oh, it's C, wash your hands. Okay, question two. When using a drug to treat animals for a parasitic disease, we should A, cross our fingers, B, call the vet, C, read the label, hint there, or D, read our Facebook posts. Who votes for A? Who votes for B? It wouldn't be a bad idea, but it's going to bug the crap out of the vet. Um, who votes for C? Who votes for D? It, of course, is C. You're getting the pattern now. There's one more question, or two more actually, but this one. If animals under our care look sick, we should A, assume it's worms and dose them. <laughs> B, send a selfie with the animal to Instagram. <laughs> C, call a veterinarian, or D, call Aquas. Who still remembers what Aquas is? <laughs> Good. Okay, what, A, who votes for A? Who votes for B? Who votes for C? Who votes for D? It, of course, is C, because I like to be consistent. They're all C. <laughs> OK, finally, it's the thing, most valuable thing we have, but none of us knows how much of it we have left. What is it? It's time, OK? And it's time for an experiment. So now we're going to have the audience participation part. So I need four volunteers, please, <laughs> up the front. Obviously, these two. Who else? Two more people. Come up here. Come up here. All right. All right. Here we go. Do you want two pairs? So you got a, it's a team event. All right. Okay. 
<laughs> All right, so who's going to be infected, the adults or the kids? Can we vote? Oh. <laughs> adults get infected. Here's, here's the worms to infect your adult with. Oh. We have to infect them. And here's the worms to infect your adult with. Oh, yeah. Okay, now what sort of worms have we brought? The worms are this horrible parasite of clothing called Garmentus pegii. Okay, humans are a vector, but it's actually the clothes that are infected. <laughs> Luckily, there's a treatment, but I've only got one. Who's going who's gonna to have the treatment? You're going to have the treatment? All right. We need pet ten parasites picked at random from the boxes on each adult. Quick, let's go. Picked at random. Well, he's, he's also not getting an unbiased sample. It will help us if you use white and green pegs, please. <laughs> Two more. All right. Okay, team two, you've got the special drench, so drench, drench your adult. Now, it only kills the white ones. So, all the, all the white ones need to go in this little dead, dead parasites bucket that's just there. It kills them instantly. It's a really potent drug. Okay, righto. Get rid of those ones. Righto. Didn't read the label, no. Off to jail for you with a big fine. Okay, all parasites off, back into the tubs. And we're going to infect them again. Oh, no. oh really? Okay. I'll help. But uh, I haven't been treated. I know. But your, your immunity is doing well. Okay, infect them again from the live bucket. Let's go. Okay, notice there were white and green pegs on both hosts last time. Are they white and... No, no, you don't get to do that. No, we've got to be consistent. <laughs> it's all part of the experimental method. All right. Okay, we're nearly up to 10. Okay, righto. Time for you to drench your host again. Oh, that's okay. You guys can be out of phase. Off you go. All right, okay, so there were still some white ones left. Now get all the green ones off, back into the box. You guys, back off into the box. You didn't get treated, so there's no change. Righto. There we go, last infection. Let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to tell you how they suck your blood. No. All right. Yeah, that, that could be true. The withholding period. Yeah. It's three treatments in three minutes. How long before she's allowed to go to the pub again? <laughs> All right, drench away. Parasite killer. Okay, so stop, stop there. How many parasites have you managed to kill off this host? Only one. So what happened? All the resistant ones lived. All the susceptible ones died. There's only resistant ones left. Resistance is? <laughs> Inevitable. <laughs> Inevitable. Okay. Right. Okay. What happened to me? Pegs away. Oh, you just, you just sadly got infected over and over again. <laughs> but at least there was no selection for resistance. All right, let's thank our volunteers. Okay, so thank you for your time. And a thanks to all the hundreds of different people I work with over the years. And a favourite little parasite that lives in the rumen of cattle and sheep. There we go. Ha. Uh -huh.
<laughs> Thanks, Peter. Peter, Peter is um, team leader, actually, for Animal Health with CSIRO um, uh, Food and Agriculture. And he's also a graduate of UNE. So if you would like to follow in Peter's footsteps, you too can do a Bachelor of Rural Science at UNE and study parasites for the rest of your life. I love that. <laughs> Peter confessed to me earlier, actually, that he would like to study the parasites of animals on Mars, um, which sounds really interesting. So I'll be looking out for that, Peter. <laughs> Now, you heard about worms and worms, are, you know, with the feature there for Peter, but parasites are actually come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, right from uh, nemat well, nematodes are worms as well, but from insects, um, right up to, to vertebrates as well. Um, so our next speaker tonight, and I, in fact, I forgot to say, Peter, but you gave your heads up though, um, there will be trivia after Tommy's talk as well. So keep, make sure you keep in the recesses of your mind the details um, of Peter's talk and also Tommy's upcoming talk, um, especially when it comes to science fiction movies and popular culture. <laughs> But Tommy Leung is, um, is an evolutionary biologist at UNE and he, it, he's really into communicating about parasites on social media. So if, um, I'm going to put this on Facebook as well, but um, if, you don't, if you know people who are interested in parasites and they aren't here tonight, please look up Tommy's blog um, and he's also really active on Twitter as the Episiarch. Um, please look that up because Tommy is also an artist and he draws parasites too. Um, so Tommy has a, a really diverse knowledge of parasites um, other than worms. So we're going to branch out from worms. Thanks for showing us a video too, Peter. I really liked that while people were eating. I thought that was a really nice touch. <laughs> so um, please join me in um, welcoming Tommy Leung to talk about body snatches. So everyone can uh, hear me okay? All right. So um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about, you know, as the slide indicates, parasite body snatchers. It's actually more of a talk about why um, kind of my beef with uh, most horror movies. Uh, I tell people I don't watch horror movies anymore because uh, they're kind of boring, to be honest. Uh, horror movies, they often have like parasites and, you know, that thing is like the main plot point as to, you know, what is the thing that is scaring or killing everyone. And my beef with horror movies featuring Parasite isn't the one that most people would think as a scientist. Um, most people might think, oh, you know, is it because they're not scientifically accurate and stuff? And, you know, to be honest, if you go and watch a science fiction film or horror film looking for scientific accuracy, that's a bit of a fool's errand. <laughs> no. My beef with horror movies is that they don't really go far enough. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about some horror movie parasites and their real life equivalent and why is it that nature is far more inventive than Hollywood. <laughs> so let's start off with the tongue bite parasite. So some of you might have come across this little parasite that are often found in mouths of fish. Uh, they're called a the tongue bite allows because that's basically what they do. So here on the, right, on the left, you see a fish with a perfectly healthy tongue. And on the right, you see there's a fish which has its tongue replaced by one of these tongue bite allows. And it's a very striking image. And uh, so much so that this particular parasite has also been mentioned on Stephen Colbert's show, The Colbert Report. It's probably one of the peak famous moment for this particular parasite. <laughs> uh, it also has some very unusual sex arrangements that I won't go into too much into. So the female's always in the front and she's the larger one. And then there's the male behind her. Uh, however, they have been known to change sex under certain circumstances, but given a limited amount of time, I won't go into the sex life of these parasites too much. <laughs> but I will say that this particular parasite has been featured in a few movies or at least inspired certain works of fiction. One example of that is this horror movie called The Bay. It was I think it was directed by the same person who did Men in Black. And then there's also a science fiction novel by Charles Strauss called uh, Apocalypse Codex, which revolved around a cult that was infected by some Eldritch version of these tongue by the parasite. Now, most people get really freaked out by the idea of having a parasite replacing your tongue, and quite rightly so. <laughs> However, I'm a bit bemused by this particular parasite, not because it's rather common, but I know that it has relatives which are even probably more horrifying for most people. I actually find them quite cute. <laughs> so uh, let's see if I could play this particular video. Yeah. 
So this particular parasite is a relative of the tongue bite parasite, but it doesn't live inside the mouth of a fish. Uh, the common name for this particular parasite is called the leather jacket louse, as indicated by the fish that is being extracted out of. And um, it's actually kind of a little bit too big to be really called a louse. So this little thing lives inside the body cavity of these fish, uh, relatively common as well. It's not unusual to come across something like this. And they poke a little hole in the belly or the chest of the fish from which it will lay hundreds of eggs. So imagine having a little hole in your belly and then every now and then some eggs just come leaking out. Uh, and it's called the leather jacket louse. And as you can see, it's uh, actually relatively large uh, for an animal of its size. So it's pretty, you know, it's about this big, uh, but if you are the size of a fish, it's like having something the size of, say, a bunny rabbit live inside your body. And, uh, oh wait, did I just say a bunny rabbit? No, it turns out that there's a little bit more going on inside this fish as well, because it seems that our leather jacket louse, is not leather jacket louse, it's, I should say leather jacket lice, because there is another one living inside there. So uh, let me have a look. Oh, yep, there it is. <laughs> There you go, there's his friend, two leather jacket lice living in a fish. If you, so a pair of these are crustaceans. So they're kind of related to deep sea isopods or slaters that you find in the backyard, except they are found in marine environment. Um, as I keep saying, this is perfectly normal. Most animals, and as Peter mentioned, most animals out in the wild or in domestic have parasites living inside them without really exhibiting any kind of uh, illness is just a natural way of life. If you are a living thing living on this particular planet, that probably means that you have other things living inside you as well. So that particular image of these parasites coming out of the chest cavity of another animal conjures up the image of a rather classic film, which is Alien in the Alien series of films. Now, in this film featured probably one of the most classic scenes of any kind of parasitic organism in cinema history, which is the chest burster. <laughs> so this infamous little parasite has basically burnt its way into the public consciousness. Uh, and are there equivalents of that in nature? Oh yes, there definitely is. <laughs> these are parasitoid wasps, and in contrast to being the villain in the Aliens film, these parasitoid wasps, at least from the human's perspective, usually are our friend because their target, the caterpillars and other kinds of insects, are usually considered as agricultural pests. So imagine instead of having a single chest burster coming out of your body, about the size of a little puppy, imagine having hundreds of little mouse-like animals chewing their way out of your body through your skin. Now, I mean, that already, I can see that some of you are already starting to turn and it's kind of a bit horrifying, but uh, that's not far enough. You see, with the chest burster, the chest burster merely burst out of the chest of its host and leave them for dead. That to me is like pretty tame as far as what parasitoid goes because real parasitoid do a lot more than that. Not only do they, as you can see, completely fill up the host with hundreds of their offspring, they also do other things to tinker with the physiology of their host as well. So for example, caterpillars, uh, the way that they use the caterpillar is not entirely indiscriminate. They're very, very careful to make sure the caterpillar stays alive for as long as possible. So these little larvae inside the caterpillar actually work their way down a very specific menu. They start off drinking a little bit of its blood, then they start moving on to the fatty tissue, they start moving on to the gonads because, well, the gonads are supposed to be there so that when it develops into an adult moth or butterfly, it will be able to reproduce, but that's not going to happen. So the caterpillar's not going to be needing those gonads. So chew those up and then it leave all the most vital organ to the last possible moment. The other thing that these particular parasitoids do to the caterpillar is that usually what happens with caterpillar is that they go through a couple of so-called instar stages. So once they get to the fifth instar stage, the next thing that happens is that they turn into a pupa before turning into a moth or butterfly. So it's kind of the caterpillar equivalent of, say, going through puberty. But what happens is that these parasitoid wasps actually changes the hormonal balance so that they never reach their equivalent of puberty. Instead of turning into a pupa, they keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger, which is a better host for the parasitoid to chew on. So those are the two things that chest bursters don't do. Now, 
The thing is, is that it doesn't really end there. The thing with the chest burster is that once it bursts out of the chest of the host, the host is left for dead. You know, the guy's screaming and then things come out of his chest and then he's dead, right? That's the end of it. He, his suffering has ended. Not so with the parasite wasps. The caterpillars, even though by the time that the parasite wasps are ready to come out and turn to cocoon, the caterpillar doesn't get to die until the wasp lets it. So this is what happens. Uh, the parasite wasp, because it has its own enemies as well, it has parasite wasps that specifically go after them, and also have various kinds of insects that would prey on this exposed cocoon. So what happens is that these particular little larva hijacks the caterpillar so that the caterpillar would sit, weave a web over the developing cocoon and sit on top of it like a brooding hen. Basically, the caterpillar spends its dying breath protecting the very thing that killed it. <laughs> and before you think this is like some kind of freak of nature, no, no, there are thousands of species that are like this. In fact, a recent paper quantified that probably one of the most numerous insects on the planet are parasitoid wasps. And they don't just go after caterpillars. There's other species that go after aphids. There's other species that go after ladybirds, which usually in fact, uh, eat aphids. There are even some that go after non-insect prey such as some of those that infect spiders. In fact, the ones that infect spiders, at the end of the development, actually make the spider weave a special web for it that protects the cocoon so that it can develop properly. So um, on all counts, it seems that the real chest burster can do a lot more horrifying things <laughs> than the actual chest burster do. Of course, these uh, parasite manipulator doesn't always have to end in death and destruction for its host. There are other cases of uh, parasite life cycle that uses the host without actually killing them. So there was this little indie film called Upstream Colors about a couple of people who got their life intertwined inexplicably to complete the life cycle of some parasites. Now, what's the real life equivalent? Well, meet Sacralina carsani. So Sacralina is, of all things, you might not be able to tell what it is because it's just this pulsating sac sticking to the belly of a crab. It's actually a parasitic barnacle. So it belongs to an entire order of barnacles called the rhizocephalon, and they specialize on infecting crabs and shrimps. Uh, the thing is, is that that is not even the whole animal. Uh, the rest of the animal is actually inside because that part that is sticking out that's actually its reproductive organ. So you basically look at the genitals of this particular parasite. So the orange bit is the reproductive organ. The rest of it is these root-like structures, these green root-like structures that extends plant-like into the body of its host and wrap themselves around various organs, such as uh, the hepatal pancreas, which is the so-called digestive digestive gland because it's got you know, the most nutrients, so it's able to draw nutrient from that. It also wraps around the gonads of the crabs because, well, as a result of the infection, the crabs become basically castrated by the parasite because the parasite divert all the resources it would have gone into reproduction to fueling its own reproduction. As you can see, it contains thousands of eggs inside its reproductive organ. But a few of the roots actually wrap themselves around the central nervous system of the crab or the shrimp in question. So when it comes time for the parasite to actually start reproducing, the crab would actually start taking care of the parasite's eggs as if it's own. It'll protect it, it'll clean it, it'll take care and aerate it to make sure that it gets plenty of oxygen as thousands and thousands of parasitic offspring come streaming out of the belly of this infected crab. Now, I haven't seen an equivalent of that in a movie and I'm very, very disappointed. <laughs> You can imagine, often these kind of like parasite body snatchers story are often some kind of allegory for some kind of social thing. You can imagine, say, you know, the suburbia picket fences, and then everyone's hiding a little secret because it turns out they're brooding a family of alien parasites. <laughs> Have you thought of something, Glenn? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Ah, right. Well, there you go. I look forward to you catching up on that. <laughs> Brood parasite uh, from space. So, of course, another parasite that often get brought up in these kind of horror movies are cordycep fungus. Now, you might not know what cordycep fungus is, but when I put it in the context of various popular science fiction or horror work, you might know more of it. 
there is, for example, an episode of the X-File that featured a parasite that was heavily inspired by the cordyceps fungus. There's also a Japanese movie about the attack of the mushroom people. There was uh, some kind of fungus that was going around turning people into mushroom people. And of course, there was a video game called The Last of Us, which was about people surviving in a post-apocalyptic situation where everyone got converted into these zombies by this fungus. In fact, they recently announced the sequel for this film at the recent E3 meeting. So the thing about the cordyceps is that often Whenever you have these kind of thing happening, especially with like zombie movies, it's always an apocalypse. But that's not exactly how it worked with the cordyceps fungus. So to think about, like to get into the mindset, so to speak, of the cordyceps fungus, I'm gonna talk a little bit about its life cycle. So usually what happens is that you have a couple of worker ants that come doing the worker ant thing, looking for food and all that kind of stuff. And some of them would stumble across what is equivalent of a fungal minefield that these particular fungus have laid down. So they lay down all these infective spores. So if an unfortunate ant is to pick up some of these spores and get infected, what happens is that as the fungus start developing inside the body, they start behaving extremely erratically. <laughs> so instead of doing what normal ants usually do, which is just to get about the day, look for food, go back to the nest, go look for food, go back to the nest. Instead, what they do is that they start stumbling around and they develop an irresistible urge to climb to really, really high places. And uh, I've heard of some people talking about the drunken stories that sound a lot like that. They start stumbling around and try to climb statues and all that kind of thing, which got me a little bit suspicious about whether they were actually drunk or there's something else going on. So when the fungus is ready to actually germinate, it causes the ant to climb up onto a high places and hang themselves down uh, on the backside of a leaf so that the fungus over the course of two weeks could come sprouting outside of their body to lay down. Uh, basically at this stage, this is how the ant looked like if you have a look at the cross section. As you can see, basically the inside of it, there isn't really much of an ant anymore. It's a fungus in ant's clothing, so to speak. Uh, so when the fungus spores start, you know, coming out, it would spray all these fungal spores onto the ground where all the other worker ants can get infected. Now, it's really, really precise with the way that it does this because if it climbs up too high, it would get dried out. If it climbs too low, uh, the spores wouldn't spread far enough. What they found is that almost always the ant position itself, the infected ant position itself about 25 centimeters above the ground before it dies. Uh, and this is accomplished by a thing that is infecting something that has a relatively simple nervous system, and the fungus itself doesn't have a nervous system. So somehow it's able to manipulate a thing that has a nervous system to carry it to where it needs to go in order to um, finish its life cycle. Now, the other thing is that they don't haphazardly hang out just anywhere. In fact, all these ants that get infected by the fungus, they position themselves onto areas where there were high traffics. So if you look at any ant colony or observe them for a long time, they follow certain trails. And what happens with the fungus is that the fungus actually make the infected ant position themselves right above those high traffic trails so that they're more likely to get infected. Now, the other thing that it does is that it doesn't really cause a kind of zombie apocalypse for the ant. In fact, when you look at it from a colony level or species level, it seems that the fungus and the ant has formed some kind of a truce. Instead of the fungus kind of going around killing and infecting everyone, so to speak, imagine a scenario where all the older individuals get sent out onto dangerous mission to forage for food, and one day they'll inevitably come across a statue of a dead person and that's when they know they've been infected and stumble into a field of spores. Because what happens is that with these worker ants, as they age, they change the role that they perform for the colony. They start out looking after, say, the nests and stuff like that, and as they get older and older, they start performing more and more dangerous tasks, such as going out foraging. So all the ants that could potentially come into contact with the spores, they're kind of already on their way out anyway, so they're almost like the sacrifice for the fungus. So the fungus is able to keep on reproducing, the ants are able to get rid of the older members of the worker cast. Uh, so that's the kind of a, and I think that would probably make for a far more horrifying existential, you know, existential type horror movie, rather than the immediate jump scare that most horror movie goes for. 
So um, basically, I've just talked about all the reasons why I find parasites really, really interesting, uh, and why you know I don't watch horror movie because all I have to do is crack open the na latest journal, uh, Parasitology <laughs> Journal, to find the latest horror story. Thank you for listening to my talk. Thank you, Tommy. Um, uh, if you if you want more horrifying stories, you can also Google uh, Creepy But Curious. Tommy's part of the Creepy But Curious team at UNE and is um, on ABC Radio, New England Northwest, regularly talking about this sort of stuff. It's on SoundCloud, so you can actually listen to episodes of Tommy talking about this back about five years. Yeah. There is hours of listening. Yeah, I talk, like, um, I talk about all kinds of things like, you know, for example, uh, horsehair worms that make cricket jump in the water and kill themselves. I talked about marine viruses. I talk about moths that feed on the tears of Madagascan bird while they sleep. Um, all kinds of creepy and, cr like creepy, and, creepy and curious, creepy and curious stories about the natural world. Um, that's what I do. <laughs> Cool. Um, I actually have a question uh, for Peter and Tommy, both of you, before we uh, get into trivia and have a bit of a break. Um, this is pretty gross, but have you, either of you guys ever had, like, in, investigated your own parasites? <laughs> Peter? <laughs> well, I'm a parent, so <laughs> of course I've had lice, as all parents do. Okay, so lice, okay. Worms? No, I've never been there. Okay. Not Tom? a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm not really sure. My parents told me when I was like six or seven, I might have had like worm of some kind, but I don't know whether they were just like paranoid about things and got me to take wormy, anti worming tablet or not. Um, as far as I know, let's see. I mean, you know, when I say my parents' place, they have cats. So. Cat flea, so there's one. Uh, I've had some leeches on it. I've been considering getting a pet leech, actually. Oh, so, yeah. Leeches. Yeah. Leech? Yeah. 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 Leeches are cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> have you have have any of you encountered like there's this species of a native like native Australian tiger leech which grows to about the size of your finger? Okay. Yeah. I think, I think you can actually get them as pets. Like there's a specialist pet store where you can sell them. And the attraction is that you only need to feed them like once or twice a year. And you don't need to buy food for them because hey, you know, <laughs> bring your own, so to speak. Great. All right, thanks guys. Um, so please join me in thanking Tommy Leung. <laughs> Uh, before I throw it to you guys, though, um, would, could you please explain the difference between a bacterial infection, because a bacteria is an organism that's feeding off another organism, a uh, bacterial infection disease, and a parasite? Okay, well, um, this might confound you a little bit, because those particular, like, bacterial, pathogenic bacteria, I, I and as well as other scientists, call them microparasites. So it's just basically a definition of scale. So for example, from a parasitology course, often I talk about examples which are viruses and bacteria because functionally speaking, they do infect another thing, so that makes them parasitic. Although I know some parasitologists who don't like calling them parasites for no good, basically arbitrary reason from my perspective, because functionally speaking, they are like parasites. So the thing about bacteria and some things like, you know, for example, ringworm, which is caused by a fungus, um, a lot of the times they live on the host commensally. They don't cause any harm. It's just that something changed about the host environment and all of a sudden they become pathogenic. Uh, so maybe the host is weakened. There's some changes to the surrounding environment, uh, the microbes that they also share the environment with, and then they you know, they become pathogenic and sometimes, um, as Peter's talk mentioned, sometimes it's the host immune system that's actually causing the disease, that they are reacting to this normally occurring flora or organisms that are usually found in the body rather harmlessly and innocuously as well. Okay, I think I've got it, I've got it. All right, it's now your turn. Um, questions from the audience. Um, can you please also maybe wait for a microphone before you ask your questions just so it comes up on our audio visual? Have we got an uh, um, audio participant? Great, we've got one up there. Uh, Peter, you mentioned that we should wash our hands after touching our pets. 
Um, what about those of us who can't keep the damn things off us at any one time? Do we live in a permanent saline solution or is it just when you do icky things, shall we say? Um, I think it's always advisable to wash your hands before you eat, perhaps, or, well, as it says in the lab, or apply makeup or, you know, lick, lick the back of labels, things like that, you know. It's, it's basically the same as the faecal oral route, you know. Wash your hands after you go to the loo, wash your hands after you pat your pet. That's going to be damn expensive in soap. <laughs> Do you always need soap, Peter? Or like would a quick, quick rinse suffice? Depends on what's on it. You... <laughs> That's not helpful. <laughs> Um, maybe we should, you just invest in a microscope as well, so you could just stick your hand under there and just see. Do Take some swabs regularly. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> but actually, that does bring me to a question, is if we are concerned about uh, bacteria, microorganisms, parasites in our home and around our families, is there a service that you can kind of take swabs or send faecal samples or whatever to test people as well as livestock? Just call your doctor. Is that gross? <laughs> Go to the doctor. Sorry. I, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, seriously. I mean, hygiene only goes to a point, right? Yeah. And, and being too clean is probably as bad for you as being too dirty. Right. You have an immune system. Like, you have an immune system for a reason. So, you know, um, yeah, use it or it goes crazy. You know, so. Mm. so, so for the questioner, make sure you treat your dog with praziquanto. That'll help, big time. Uh, <laughs> Question. Yeah, down the front here. Um, I've got geckos, so what, when I handle them, what I need to wash my hands after that? Uh, yeah, I think you should because they, you know, people do say like vets and other people who are experts in this, they do say that, you know, to make sure you don't get salmonella or like other kinds of bacteria that might be on them. So yeah, advisable to wash your hands after handling um, any kind of animals like that, including reptiles. Would it be fair to say that every living organism has a parasite of some sort? Um, there would be stuff living on you. Uh, it's just that the definition of parasite, as you mentioned, is something that causes like some kind of detrimental harm to the host. And sometimes um, you can have things that are living in or on you without you noticing. And by definition, that's not a parasite because it's not causing you any harm. Mm -hmm. But something might you know, change in your health condition or change in the environment uh, might cause them to start causing harm. So often it's a bit of a gray area where whether something is actually a parasite or not. So that's why I also prefer using the term symbiont because it covers all the range of interaction that something could possibly have with its host. Mm -hmm. So different classes of organisms have more or less parasites though. So mammals tend to have a lot. Um, nematodes, free living nematodes, which I've also worked on, very few parasites are free living nematodes. Do we know why that is? No. <laughs> um, I actually recently did a submitted a paper in a previous few papers that were published looking at different groups of animals. So the last group of animals that uh, myself and my collaborator in Canada looked at were birds. And we looked at a couple of different factors relating to the ecology and how that influence the diversity of nematode worms living inside, whether some birds have, you know, six different species and others have like 20 different species. And we found that there was a couple of different factors including um, you know, what they eat. So those that have a carnivorous or omnivorous diet tend to have a wider diversity of roundworms living inside them because many of these worms use these prey animals as intermediate hosts, uh, much like you know, with the hydatids. Uh, migratory birds also have a greater diversity because they go over the place and 
presumably they pick up worms where they go. Um, and body size also makes some kind of a difference. The spleen size, which is an indication of co-evolution with those particular parasites, the more different kinds of parasites they deal with, they have to deal with, they tend to have larger spleen as well. Because the more parasites, the bigger your spleen. Yeah, yeah, because they have to deal, like the spleen plays a very important role in their immunity, immune system of birds. And so that's one of the indicator organ for the parasite pressure. So um, there are a couple of different factors relating to both the evolutionary history as well as the ecology of these particular animals in terms of determining like which species have more parasites than others. And this is like you know, one of the ongoing field of ecological parasitology that I look into. So I recently, um, once again with my Canadian collaborator, uh, submitted a study looking at lizards actually, like what you know, what lizards have like more parasites and we found that once again, herbivorous lizards tend to have lower parasite diversity because they don't get exposed to all the different parasite larval stage that can live in insects and stuff like that. Whereas the carnivorous ones tend to have wider diversity of parasites living inside them. So there are certain things, um, basically it comes down to you are, well, you are infected by what you eat, so to speak. So. I love that take on you are what you eat. I'm going to use that. You are infected by what you eat. That's the title of the manuscript was submitted, so... Oh, really? Oh, I'm keeping an eye out for it. That's fantastic. Uh, another question here. Can you just write your own horror movies if you just want to see more scary uh, bugs I'll, and stuff? Uh, if anyone wants to give me a million dollar and a film crew... Uh, and a scriptwriter, I would very much welcome that. Uh, let me kick, let, let me plug my Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, that's, well, I maybe, don't have a Kickstarter uh, campaign. I'm just maybe, kidding. Maybe we'll flag that at the next regional science hub meeting. We could help crowdfund this for Tommy. I think that's a great idea. It's a great idea. Uh, any are there any other questions? From the floor, another one down here. What's your favourite parasite? That's really hard to pick. I've got like about a dozen. There's, uh, um, there's leucocoridium, which is a tree uh, parasitic fluke that infects snails and they reproduce inside a snail. And they, if you ever, you might have seen videos of them, like what they call the zombie snails. The larval stage of this particular parasite goes to the eyes of the snail and it changes the behavior and it pulsates. They've got these like bright green, yellow patterning and it actually tricks, well, Theoretically, they trick birds into thinking that those pulsating eye, like brood sacs inside the eye, are caterpillars. So the bird come along thinking it's a caterpillar, eats it, and that's the next host in life cycle. So that's one. I thought you were going to say that it tricks birds into wanting a dance party with their like pulsating eyes. Well, <laughs> I, I, hey, there's no study looking at whether that kind of parasite induces rave party among snails, <laughs> but I'm sure if you know the researchers who study these particular parasites could be convinced to uh, do something like that. Um, there's a like. It's really hard to pick, That's like funny. I said, you know, I read a lot about parasites, I write about them regularly, so every now and then I'll come across like a lot of really interesting ones. Um, one recently interesting one I came across was a parasitic fungus that infects cicadas, so they infect uh, these periodic cicadas that comes out once every 13 or 17 years, and they go to the abdomen of the cicada, and it kind of basically make their butt disintegrate. So half the cicada basically just get turned into this powdery spores of the fungus, but they also found that it changes the behavior of the cicada so that um, normally what happens with cicada is that the male would you know, give off the core and then the female, if they are receptive to the core, they'll give a little wing flick, kind of like, hey, hey boys. Um, you know, so that's how cicadas flirt. But what this particular fungus does is that it actually almost like put in a new program into the male cicadas. So the male cicadas that are infected will start flirting like the female cicadas. So the male cicada will come and also pick up the fungus as well. So they still otherwise still behave like normal male cicadas. They still call, they still all do all those things, except that when other male cicadas are around and they hear the call, they also do the little wing flick and go, hey boy. Come here. So uh, yeah, so there's the the one that makes it more flu There's the virus that infects crickets and there there, there are a lot of yeah, stuff. Yeah. I, I You're can safe go to here say literally. A lot of favorites. Yeah, yeah. I can go here like all night, literally. You know. <laughs> You'll be like, ha ha ha, that's really funny, and then like three hours later, go, oh, please let me leave. 
Cool. Questions in the audience? Um, Peter, I have a question for you. Um, what at currently, I mean, given that um, Australian agriculture, is, you know, is dependent on a lot of is stock health, um, what currently, what parasite is probably the greatest threat to Australian agricultural livestock? And, and what sort of, um, I guess, economic, um, you know, loss do we, does it cause? So the answer is three. Mm -hmm. So for cattle, it's the cattle tick. Mm -hmm. And for sheep, it's both the sheep blowfly. So the maggots of the sheep blowfly eat the flesh, the skin and the flesh of the sheep. Uh, and the barber's pole worm, which is the most pathogenic of the three commonly encountered parasites of sheep. Right, so that's really interesting. Three different groups, like yeah. an a, 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 a carina, a tick, yes, and an insect, yes, and a worm, and a worm. And it depends on how you measure it. So for um, the farmer looking at what he's getting paid, or he or she's getting paid for the animals that are sent for slaughter, things like nodule worm, liver fluke, and hydatids are really important, and an, another cestode commonly called sheep measles, they're important because you can see it, you know, you get paid less for those animals if their carcasses are condemned because of infections with those worms. But the other worms we work on, homonchus, trichus, strongulus, telodosagia, the three main genera of intestinal worms in sheep, they cause a huge amount of production loss. So between sheep and cattle, we're losing about $450 million of production a year from those guys. So that's, that's the big ticket item. And it's, it's, it's a similar amount for sheep blowfly. And it's a similar amount for cattle tick. Wow, that's big business. So we're talking about billions of dollars. Yeah. Nationwide. So I will spruik do a, doing rural science again in that case, um, you know, to keep animal, animals alive as well. Um, questions? Is anyone? Yeah, oh, great. <laughs> Down the front here. Now the microphone's actually on. Um, when I was a kid, we had a, a, a medical book that had been passed down from my grandfather, I think. It was pre-1900. And every illness, just about, in the book was caused by nematodes. <laughs> like, if you had a headache, you'd look up headache, right? Oh, let's look up, it'll be nematodes, right? Um, stomach ache, nematodes. Everything was nematodes. You have sore eyes, nematodes. And... Um, um, was it actually like that back in those days or was this book just crazy? I think it, it was probably a little crazy. But remember that since those times we've got anti-helmetic drugs, which I talked about. We've also got um, drugs that control bacterial infections and, and other things. So the importance of these infectious diseases is less than it was. We've also have vaccines. <clears throat> so from that point of view, yes, it was probably more likely then. But they seem to have jumped on a lot of different things. Yes, there are lots of nematode parasites that infect humans and cause disease. Elephantiasis is one. Um, intestinal worms. <coughs> excuse me. Liver fluke and hydatids. But um, the frequency of those illnesses now is very low and probably wasn't that high then, especially the neurological ones that you're talking about. It's really the stuff Tommy and I talked about, like the rat lung worm that accidentally goes to your brain and causes neurological symptoms. I mean, these are occasional things that you pick up. Well, well it, was, it was very low in our family because I think we were treated for worms on just about every occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Headache <laughs> worm. Yes, yeah, well, you know, it's always possible to pick up these things and, and this is why we have the basic hygiene principles of wash your hands, for example, because um, they prevent them happening. But sometimes the chance of them happening isn't that high anyway. So maybe without, you'd be OK. And also going back to the whole you are infected by what you eat thing, you'll be amazed by how many parasites you can stop from um, infecting you just by cooking food. So um, I recently read a paper that was an unusual intersection between my various different interests. Uh, it was a medical report about a fighter pilot who was stationed in Japan uh, for the US Air Force. 
And he was one of the elite fighter pilots that flew the F-22, which is the top of the line fighter jet. And he was really quite distressed because it turns out they had a tapeworm inside of him and the tapeworm probably came from him eating uh, sashimi, raw fish. So he was tasting some of the local cuisines and uh, apparently, according to the medical report, the tapeworm wasn't really causing him much problem. He was just extremely distressed by the idea of having a tapeworm living inside of him. So yeah, the top fighter jet in the world was beaten by a tapeworm. <laughs> That's fantastic. I have to add one more because Tommy reminded me about cooking. So fermentation doesn't necessarily work. So throughout Cambodia and, and Laos and perhaps in parts of Vietnam, there's a, a fluke called Opus thorcus, which lives in fish, fish that live in the rivers and that people eat. And the people traditionally like to eat a fermented fish product. So they, they harvest the fish, <coughs> they treat it a certain way, and it's a fermented product that they in, then eat. Unfortunately, this um, is something that can cause an infection in the people. And even more unfortunately, and, and rare as far as I'm aware, maybe Tommy can comment on this, it often causes a cancer and the people die. So it actually causes a cancer of the bile duct. Um, so, you know, bad things happen when you don't cook food. There is actually a research group who are studying the genome of this particular parasite at the moment at University of Melbourne because this particular parasite secretes some, I guess, very unusual, I guess, almost growth hormone or growth stimulant type products. Uh, and that's the reason why it sometimes causes the cancer because what the parasite's doing is that it sort of re-engineer the inside, that part of the body to make it more suitable place for it to live in. And there's a side effect of that because they're doing all this renovating inside the liver of the host. Uh, Sometimes, you know, renovation goes wrong, I'm sure people know, so. Renovations that go wrong, that's the next block. I love that. <laughs> Ron, you reminded me um, actually of a great childhood memory of my own is looking through childcraft books at all the diseases. Um, I'm sure, you know, many people have um, childhood memories of trying to find medical books that to work at, like self-diagnose or something. And there's there's a, a whole heap of great medical books if you want to get your hands on that have photos of parasites and infectious diseases for kids if you want to diagnose yourself. <laughs> Great I think, memory, I think most self people diagnosis. These, yeah, most people these days just use WebMD and everyone yeah. like end up diagnosing for cancer, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, it's true. We had another question, James. This might be a dull semantic question about parasitism, but I used to classify flowers that didn't reward their pollinators as a form of parasitism because there's a net negative effect. Is that not the case anymore? Do we not consider that parasitism? Um, it probably depends on the person you talk to. So for example, there are some forms of parasites, I was just talking to someone in the audience previously, um, which are brood parasite. So things like cuckoo and such. So even though they don't live inside the body of the host, they do cause detriment, like you know, reproductive detriment to the host as well. And there are various different types of birds as well as many different insects and even at least one species of fish that have evolved to have this brood parasitism. Um, and there are many, like one of the introductory lecture I give for parasitology, I talk about all these different forms of parasitism, which is not the conventional form that you thought of. So uh, from that perspective, you can say the orchid is kind of a, a sexual parasite in that it, you know, it, because the male wasp that it tricks uh, only have like limited resources to go around, you know, mating with all these flowers. Um, there is also a species of fish called the Amazonian molly that does a similar thing to related species of fish. So this species is found in Mexico, but it's called the Amazonian molly because the entire species is entirely female. So what this particular fish does is that it goes to the male of a related species and gets him to mate with her, but do not use his sperm, and only use the sperm as a way to stimulate the reproductive cycle. So some researchers have called them sexual parasites because the male doesn't get anything out of it, uh, so to speak, well, from a reproductive perspective anyway. Uh, <laughs> but it really depends on like how you decide to use the term parasitism in terms of like whether, but. I guess for what, for the purpose of this particular talk, we've been talking about conventional parasites, so to speak, so parasites that live in or on the host as opposed to 
indirectly exploiting the host in some way. Mm. It's really interesting. I um, I it reminds me a little bit of decapitating flies in ants. They they live in, but um. Are there any, so the ants that I'm thinking of, red imported fire ants, um, are attacked by forehead flies who, if they have a chance, lay eggs in the body and the um, larvae work their way up to the head and basically just sever the head. It's great. Um, but, but they, and the idea is actually using it as a biological control to try and control whole populations, but they, they actually can't control whole populations. They just kind of suppress populations. So I guess my question to you is, um, do, are there any other biological controls that you know of that we, we use or we manipulate as humans with parasites? Um, yes, there is some that um, I think from some nursery places you can get. There is uh, some... Oh, the, the nematode? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So there are these nematodes that kill insects. So uh, they're microscopic nematode, the larval stage, you can spread them into the soil. And what they do is that they actually infiltrate their way inside the body of the insect. And then they also have a symbiotic bacteria that lives with them. And the symbiotic bacteria is actually the killing agent. So it releases the bacteria. The bacteria kills the insect and turns the inside of it into basically kind of like a goop. And then the worm basically swim and live and feed inside of it and produce the next generation. And then they come out and then infect more insects. So that has been used as a biological control. And I think there are like some gardening places you can get these worms from. Um, other forms of biological control include parasitoid wasps, like forward flies aren't as effective for fire ants, but you know, for things like caterpillars and such, um, there are some you know, uses for parasitoid wasps to control various things as well. Uh, so yeah, um, parasites have been used as uh, various biological control. Hence, I mentioned that even though you know, as scary as the real life chestbursters are, some of them would be considered as uh, friends for farmers you know, from the human perspective. Yeah, definitely. Peter. So the thing is that people have tried to use parasites as biological controls before and it hasn't always worked. So I think it's important to remember that it's about the, the population dynamics of the parasite and, and the thing you're trying to control and whether they're in kilter with each other. So the myrmithid nematodes that Tommy had uh, talked about that are similar to the nematomorph that he showed in the picture they're too slow. Their life cycle is too slow to have an effect on the thing. Another one that was tried was capillaria, which is a, a parasite. This particular one was a parasite of mice as a way of controlling plague mouse. Oh. Now it worked. How really did they infect? How did they infect all the mice? How did that well, spread? This is the nasty bit. So the thing about mice is when you when you concentrate them a lot into a small space, they start to cannibalise each other. And so this particular one, Capillaria hepatica, if, if one mouse eats the other mouse's liver, it gets infected right. and, then, and then the cycle goes on. So this worked really well in the middle of a plague, but then as soon as the plague ends, the parasite died out. Yeah, so it's density dependent. There's, there's no more transmission. Mm. And another example of that, which actually involves viruses, is the Mexmo virus that was released to control rabbits initially. So the thing about using any kind of biological agent is that biological agents have their own agenda, which might not match up with our own. So for example, the life cycle might take too long. Uh, in addition to that, if they, uh, you know, if they kill the host too quickly, they might not be able to reproduce as much, which is the thing that they want to do to basically make more of themselves. So what happened with the Mexmo uh, virus is that initially upon its release, it was extremely deadly to rabbits, but over the years it become attenuated and become less and less lethal. And the exact same thing happened in the UK as well when they try to use it against the feral rabbits they have there as well. So basically, if you try to use any biological agent, you know, biological pest control, or in some cases, you know, biological weapons, um, the thing about them is that you can't control them. It's like, you know, when, any, when it comes to any kind of biological weapon scenario, it's not like a gun and you point at it and it shoots a thing over there. What if the gun has a mind of its own and go, I'm not gonna shoot today. I wanna do other things like spit out your bullets in the opposite direction. That's what it's like using a biological agent. Unpredictable. Yeah. Mm. Questions from the audience? Any more? Surely. 
We have time for probably one or two questions. I, I don't want to dominate the questions, that's all, because I want James to come up and tell us the winner of the trivia as well, um, that you win all accolades and prestige and nothing tangible except, you know, <laughs> just kudos at Science in the Club. But we also need to draw um, the ticket as well. Um, questions? Questions? All right, I'm going to ask you. A short story. Okay, yeah. Would you like a story? Yes, yeah, so we want a story. We do want who's, a story. Who's read Alice in Wonderland? Oh. Right. Yeah. Remember the Red Queen? Yep. So there's a concept we like to talk about called the Red Queen's race. So the Red Queen, in her special race, she runs as fast as she can to stay still. If she doesn't run fast enough, she goes backwards. So we think of the parasite and the host evolving together. Mm -hmm. So the parasite is evolving to get its nutrients out of the host as much as it can and the host is evolving to cope with a parasite or, or avoid it with the immunity or whatever it is and they're both evolving together and they're going along together. So it's a really important concept. So the very well adapted parasite isn't hurting the host. They're in a red queen's race together. Rushing around as fast as they can and getting nowhere. Getting nowhere. But that's evolution for you. <laughs> I have a little addendum to the uh, Red Queen story. <laughs> there is one organism that has managed to opt out of the Red Queen co-evolution arms race with its parasite. And that particular org organism are rotifers. So rotifers are actually really, really common. If you scoop up a bit of pond water, you'll see these little peculiar little animals swimming around. If they stay still, they have these little wheels on their head. Uh, if they swim around, they look just kind of like a blob. Um, the thing about these rotifer is that there's two peculiar things about them. One of them is that they can dry out almost completely and still kind of stay in this like suspended animation state. And if you wet them again, they'll come back to life. The other thing too is that when scientists look at their genetics, it indicates that they have not had sex for at least the last 70 million years. So they're one of the few organisms on the planet to reproduce entirely asexually for a very, very long time because it wouldn't work otherwise because the Red Queen evolution answers will catch up with you. Your parasite will catch up with you and if you don't adapt, you'll die it out. So somehow the Rotifers found a way to get around that and that actually ties in with the way that it can dry out almost completely. So there is a species of fungus that specifically target Rotifers and Rotifers in response to this particular fungus instead of evolving or uh, sexually recombin you know, having sexual recombination the way that other organisms do, they just shrivel up and they just let the wind take them away to somewhere where the parasites aren't found. And they can shrivel up and withstand dehydration to a higher degree than the fungus that targets it. So it just keeps on running away from its problems. So that seems to be a That's viable so way of cool. life. <laughs> Rather than adapting and evolving. I love that. Is that the same thing as tardigrades? Tardigrades well, do that too, don't the, they? Here's the interesting thing. A few <laughs> years ago, I did write a paper talking about this unique phenomena of the so-called escape from the Red Queen. And I suggested that one possible other organism can, that can do that is probably the tardigrade. Now, I don't know if anyone's had looked into that yet. Mm. Uh, but yeah, tardigrade, given that it does share that particular special trait that it does with rotifers, it might also be another animal that is managed to escaping from its usual kind of parasite. Because there, there are parasitic fungus that target tardigrade as well. Yeah, so right. we don't know whether they also run away from the problem, so to speak. That's very cool. If you guys don't know what tardigrades or rotifers are, go home and Google them. Um, you can also Google water bears for tardigrades. They're really cool. All microscopic little things. Um, yeah, very cool strategies um, to survive and reproduce. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that we got onto tardigrades and rotifers on a parasite <laughs> night. How really could do. you not? How could you not? I know, I know, it's true. Um, I have a question. Um, you, I just want to sort of clarify some definitions as well. We, we heard a number of terms tonight, parasites, but also parasitoid, um, microparasite, all these sorts of things. Can you guys just um, explain the difference between a parasite and a parasitoid for people who might not know that difference? Uh, well, 
A parasitoid usually, oh, yeah, he's an, another one of those like gray areas. A parasitoid usually kills its host at the end of it. So, for example, you know, chestburster, if you were to give it a scientific term, it would be a parasitoid, just like the wasp that I compare it to. But the thing is that there are other parasites that do that. For, so, for example, the horsehair worms, um, for example, the nematode that kills insects, you know, for biological control, they also kill the host, but by some kind of convention, people don't call them parasitoids. Like I've submitted papers where I call them parasitoids and go, no, you're not supposed to call them parasitoids. Uh, so most- so personal preference almost sometimes, do you think? Yes, although the general definition, if it comes to like those parasitoid wasp and flies, if you call them parasitoid, no one will argue with you. If, if they you kill the host. Yes, they yeah. kill the host. But when it comes to those nematodes that also kill the insects, if you call them parasitoids, um, I will be cool with it, but there might be some scientists that are not. Okay. So, so send yeah. your paper to you <laughs> to be reviewed if you're calling it. Okay. I mean, those fungus that kill the, the the ants and cause them to grow that, like, you know, that stalk, they are technically parasitoids as well, but, you know, they're not called parasitoids. Mm. Um, so uh, nature don't conform to our categories. You know, we come up with these terms for our own convenience to categorize things, but nature just go, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that help? Does that help understand? Sometimes I sort of get confused about those um, ones as well. Um, one last one, actually, before we do some um, announcing of prizes. Um, I'm going to bring up vertebrate-vertebrate interactions and just ask you about to clarify a few relationships. Um, so, you know, remoras and fish that attach to, like, manta rays and big sharks and things like that, are they technically parasites or are they just symbionts living with the fish? Well, it's like as if you just read my entire you know, publication history because oh. I did write a paper <laughs> that addressed this. <laughs> I wrote a paper. I should have done more reading, clearly. Tom. Well, you seem to have accidentally <laughs> done some reading. Um, so, the so I wrote a paper about how there are certain fish that exhibit behaviour that kind of borders on parasitism. Um, remoras aren't really as such because they just attach on the host. It's kind of a convenient way for them to travel around. Yeah. However, they do impose hydrodynamic drag, and they are somewhat oh. irritating to like having something attached onto you. They are very, very irritating. Like a bunny rabbit, not in you, but just on just, you. Yeah, yeah. Or hanging yeah. on yeah. you. Yeah. And they just attach onto anything. Like scuba divers have gotten, you know, remoras attached on them. It's really difficult to oh, get wow. rid of them. They're yeah. very good at sticking onto things. However, there are some species of fish that, for example, um, that feed on blood. Uh, for example, lamprey. So once again, lamprey is another one of those like, you know, gray area definition because some people call them micro predators. So there's another term that has not been mentioned uh, yeah. yet. So micro predator is a term for when you eat an animal, but you don't kill it um, immediately. You only eat a bit of it. So, for example, mosquitoes. Is that or, like when a kitten plays with a grasshopper for like, or a mouse for like an hour or two before they <laughs> really hack into it? Well, they did the, the the thing the prey does eventually die and get eaten entirely. So that's more of a usual predator prey thing. But micro predators are things like, for example, cookie, cookie cutter sharks. I don't know how many of you have heard of the cookie cutter shark. It's a shark that's not very big. It's only about forty or so centimeters long. But what it does is that it has a special jaw that it goes up and take basically what looks like a melon scooper, scoop of flesh out of like all kinds of things like whales and dolphins and sharks. Even what, there was one case where they tried to take a bite out of a nuclear submarine, out of the rubberized bit of like sonar um, detector. So uh, yeah, they're pretty brazen. So they're called micro predators because they, oh yeah, of course, someone's gonna think, has it eaten a great white shark? Yes, there are, cookie cutter shark has gone after the great white shark. So it is the true top predator of the ocean. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but these things are called micro-predators, and some people also classify things like fleas and leeches as micro-predators. Uh, but at the same time, some people also classify micro-predator as a subset of parasites. So once again, it comes down to like, you know, we come up with these terms for our own convenience, but nature is like, if it works, it works. We don't care whether you call them parasitism yeah, or micro-predator yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Call them what you will when you go home <laughs> tonight. Um, so on that great note, learning about the top predator in the sea, thank you for that. Um, one more question, really? Have we got time for one more question? Is it a quick question? 
Oh, about the cookie cutter oh, shark. Yeah. Okay. Um, how deep can the cookie cutter shark go to like a certain depth or um, does it just live throughout I, the whole ocean? I don't know if scientists actually know how deep they can go at the moment because actually relatively little is known about the cookie cutter shark. Like, um, you know, you, most of the most of what we know about cookie cutter shark comes from mostly either dead specimens or when you come across like large marine animals that have a chunk of flesh taken out of them, it's like, well, that's the signature sign of a cookie cutter shark. Um, but they do go down quite deep because one of the ways that they manage to eat you know, bigger things, bigger than them, is that their belly is actually bioluminescent. So they can, they make like, you know, they make their belly glow, but their uh, pigmentation are distributed in such a way so that the belly shows off like, it almost looks like a tiny little fish or tiny little squid. So these big fish like marlin or tuna or sharks or even dolphins and whales come along and go, oh, I'm gonna get a feed. And then the cookie cutter shark comes along and get a feed instead. So um, yeah, there's still a lot that we don't know about like how these things live. Like that attracting and mimicry thing. Great. Um, we have announcements of trivia winners. Um, before James does that, could you please join me in thanking Peter and Tommy for a great QA?